This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. Presented by First Light, creating proven, versatile hunting apparel from merino base layers to technical outerwear for every hunt. First Light, go farther, stay longer. You, you listeners are coming in late to a conversation, but I was just fixing to tell um, Chester here on the subject of finding arrowheads. My kids had, did I tell you about this? They were messing with you, the metal detector. No, you didn't. And they struck some metal with that metal detector. And on the way, digging down to the metal, found a piece, a big worked piece of black obsidian. Uh, and in their heads, it detects that. And I was trying like, no, yeah. this is coincidence. <laughs> we were, dude, it was something, it wanted to be an old hunk of barbed wire fence. Was this in your yard? What's that? Where did this happen at? Oh, no, 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 up in the mountains. Oh, okay. Yeah. They want to be an old, but here's, here's the weird deal. That fencing was lower than it. Hmm. That's pretty wild. Like got worked, I don't know. Yeah. Beautiful piece of worked black obsidian. Like how big? About like uh size of your thumb. That little pocket, if I think it's the same place. Mm-mm, it's not the same place. Okay. Well, where we were, it's loaded with flakes, chips, yeah. obviously arrowheads. Yeah, stay out of there. We will. <laughs> um real quick, who are you guys rooting for on the when uh who are you guys rooting for between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg? Oh, this is, I've been talking about this a lot. I do a sports radio show. We talk about this yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Not, uh, not who's going to, well, I want to know who's going to win, but who are you rooting for? Uh, see, <laughs> I'm rooting for Elon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think Zuck is just a little, like a sociopath, psychopath kind of. So I, you know, he's won jujitsu tournaments already. So, mm-hmm. well, I don't know how, how much does either of them weigh? Uh, well, Elon's definitely heavier than Zuck. So he's going to have to cut. If it's really going to happen, I think. So, but, you know, if you saw Elon's uh, tweet, he said that his, his main move is the, the walrus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he just lays on you. See, I don't use, I don't <laughs> like, I don't even know why. I'm rooting for him, but I don't know why. Because there's nothing he's involved in to interest me. I don't use Twitter. I have zero interest in Mars. <laughs> I will never buy a Tesla electric car. I've bought, like, a thing on PayPal in the last 10 years. <laughs> What else Starlink? you got going on? Do you use Starlink? That I would get yeah. into. Yeah, see, yeah. Starlink Sorry. is smart. I do like him. <laughs> Starlink is the, is my favorite. I yeah, I don't it. know why I'm rooting for him so bad. I, I just, thought, I just something about Facebook is just evil to me. Yeah, and you know, and the, <laughs> well, he also my problem has Instagram, too. which I think you use daily. No, I do use that, okay. but I don't yeah. think that my access to that, if he gets whooped, it just that doesn't even matter that much to me. You know, it is. I use one of his products, but you know what the problem? My problem is is uh. Remember that movie about Facebook? Social network. Social network. Yeah, they painted like a very unflattering perspective. Mm-hmm. That that for me is that's that. Right. That's the story. Like, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, and uh I just have I have a friendlier um uh I have a friendlier yeah, I just like Elon Musk. I, I don't know know the guy at all. Join today <laughs> by <laughs> That's so random. <laughs> oh, no, it's been on my mind, man. And it's I not the kind of thing my wife's going to talk to me I about. Thought the, I thought the fight was already called off. No. No. Oh, no, they're trying to make no, it No, you're thinking of Pergozin's... Uh, no, you're no. You're thinking of Pergozin's... No, there, was, there, was, no. There, was something, there was something in the news about how Elon yeah, Musk's Elon, mom Elon said he Musk came do out and he said, my mother asked me not to fight, and so oh, we're not going to fight. really? Yeah, yeah. See, I thought you were confused about the, no, uh, the coup in Russia. They're similar in a now, lot of ways. And this, yeah. and this fight. <laughs> Get the Wagner group and the, Musk. The coup in Russia I've was... Been, I've been reading equal amounts about both. Oh, yeah. I find Talk about both. a short-lived coup. Yeah, that was so fast. Nothing happened. I know. I could, I could like, woke up in the morning, like, expecting, you know, the, the Kremlin, you know, and he's like, we've decided to go home. <laughs> I was like, man, I don't think that's, I don't think that works. He's a way. hot dog. <laughs> he's a hot dog vendor. Yeah, I don't think that's, it works that way. Well, like way you, ago. Way yeah, ago. I know, but you know, humble origins. Joined today by uh, former Denver Broncos defensive end Derek Wolf, 
who sacked. I mean, how many times do people point this out? That you sacked Tom Brady. You probably sacked all kinds of people. I got Tom Brady. I, he, I sacked him the most, though. He's the quarterback that I got to the most. Here's my here's my first question for you. We're gonna come back to this more. When if you talk to I don't want I'm not trying to equate military to service, which I have no experience in, to athletic, which I have no experience in. <laughs> but uh let's just say continue. Okay. If you talk to to military uh professionals, you're striving toward a like a dispassionate approach. Meaning if you're going to like raid bin Laden's compound, you take the same mental attitude as all of the other dozens or hundreds of raids you'd been on. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, it, it, you're aware, but when it comes to doing it, it's just, that's out of your head. Yeah. It doesn't matter who it is. Yep. You're, it's like, you it's know, it's the guy with the ball, see ball, get ball. Yep. Like that's, that's, it's simple. So, it, but in your mind, are you like, I am going to, I have the potential right now to sack this guy that people sit. It, it's not how it does. Really? You don't even care. You don't try harder. Because when you're out there, everybody's on an equal playing level. You're like everybody's yeah. on the same level. Like it does. You don't think like that. You don't think like, oh, this is Tom Brady. Really? No, just, you, you just, you know, and I was, I, maybe I'm different because when I first got drafted by Denver, Peyton Manning was my quarterback. So I had a relationship with Peyton Manning right away. So I wasn't like starstruck. You know what I mean? And then yeah. my first sack in the first game was against Star Ben Roethlisberger. Shot. You know, it's like guys you get, get st- nervous when you sack them. <laughs> well, guys get seriously. Guys kind of get like that sometimes, where they're like, they know, get starstruck yeah. about a player. Well, they you as I got older, like in my fourth season, I'd seen the rookie cu- rookies come in and they'd mm-hmm. see Peyton and they'd be like, and then not realize that he's just like a normal guy that you know drinks Bud Heavy and plays football and you know he's just a normal guy. Yeah. Like he'll sit down at breakfast, have a conversation with you about whatever. He's just that kind of guy. And Tom Brady's the same way. He's a competitor. You know what I mean? Out there on the field, like you, if you get him and make a good play, he'll tell you, like, a good play, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. He'll be like, oh, that was a good play. You got me on that one, you know? Huh. That was, he, like, you bat one of his passes, he'll lose his mind. You know, quarterbacks hate that when you, like, bat passes, yeah. um, block balls and stuff like that. But, you know, he's just a, a great competitor. Probably the best competitor I ever played against, honestly. Because you could, you know, the AFC Championship game in 2015, um, the first series of the game, I buried him. And this is when you could still land on the quarterback. <laughs> and I buried him, like put all 300 pounds on him uh-huh. and just buried him into the ground. And he just, that's a, people forget how tough he really was. Like he jumped right back up. Like it was nothing. And I, I heard the wind leave him, you know, it was like, <gasps> <laughs> oh, man. you know, and it was like the first, like, I think it was the third play of the game. And uh-huh. we ended up hitting him 27 times in that game. Oh, so he got buried 27 times and he still almost came back and beat us. They made a rule that you're not supposed to land on the quarterback? Yeah. What are you supposed to land on, your elbow? Uh, oh, they want you to, like, do everything you can. So you can't hit him below the knees. You can't touch his head at all. Don't even, like, graze his head. And you what? can't hit him with your own head. You can't grab him and whip him to the ground. Dude, that's so got to be so... It, it changed everything. It made it a lot harder to to, to tackle him. So it's, it's like you're, you're, like, playing in the yard with your kids. Well, you, like, yeah, it's, like, pick him up. It like, I don't know. I, so yeah, the like first I, year I they implemented... I pick my kids up and set them down. The first year they implemented that rule... <laughs> this is a little off. So the first year they implemented that rule, I missed, like, seven opportunities to have a sack, right? And these are, you know, this... We could talk about... Because you're well, nervous. Well, it's not even that. It's just that, like, yeah, you're nervous because the fine... That's so, what I'm saying. Like you're nervous about a, breaking the it's rule. It's a fifteen to twenty five thousand dollar fine when you get those roughing the passer calls. That comes out of whose pocket? Mine. Really? Yeah. Just take it pre tax too, and they're already taxing <laughs> you. I'm already paying fifty percent. You know, I'm already paying half of my money to the gut to Uncle Sam, and then the you know the league is like, oh, by the way, you had a penalty. So here's a fifteen thousand dollar fine that just shows up in your locker, and you never you don't even write the check. They just take it out of your paycheck. It's crazy. So the first year wow. of them implementing that. But when you're that, watching football, they don't have the, they don't like put that like in no, the no, stats. No, no, they don't talk like about how that. how much you owe. <laughs> how many fines has he paid? Uh, you can find for all kinds of stuff. We had a guy yeah. that, you know, weight fines, it's $1,000 a pound. What's that mean? When you're, when you, you have a, you have a weight that you're supposed to be at. Yeah. And if you're over or under that weight, it's a thousand bucks a pound. How precise is the weight? It, it depends. How wide is the band? So underweight is usually like forgivable. But when you're overweight, that's when they start hitting you. Like if you're one or two pounds over, they'll. But they how might big warn is the you. band you're supposed to land in? 
So, all right. So, for example, we had a guy that his his report his report weight was three hundred thirty pounds. He showed up at four of like four fifteen at training camp, and over that season, he got fined three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. God, that takes body body, sh- body shame into a whole new level, right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta you gotta like every Friday you weigh body in. shaming. Is that by the NFL or by, by the team. Your team? That's by the team. Okay. Didn't Von Miller famously get fined for farting? In like a film session too. Oh yeah, that was it. Yeah, so we. That's like a. Was that? That's like a position group what? thing. So uh-huh. every position group in their room. So we always had. It was a hundred. It was a five hundred dollar fine for farting. <laughs> who, so who created if you got a that? Fart, we just. The fun thing about those ones are. Was that, you guys self police? Yeah. Oh yeah. Because you get. Because yeah, you, you, you get. You're plus one hundred. You're plus a hundred for snitching. Rip. You wouldn't like. <laughs> well, you're plus a hundred for snitching. So if I catch somebody farting, oh. I'm like, hey, it was him. It was him. I get a hundred bucks. <laughs> this right here is one of the many reasons I didn't become a professional football player. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's simple. Just it was, get up and walk out and fart. You know what I mean? So. Uh, funny thing about Vaughn is Vaughn ended up bringing you know those that fart spray. Oh yeah, he'd bring that fart spray it's and spray idea. it, and just everybody would lose like it yeah, just yeah. clear the whole room out for a couple hours. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> the fun thing about those fines, those room fines, like the position fines, we get to take that money at the end of the year and go do something for ourselves with it, like as a group. You know, go Got go to like a big dinner, go I like see. go to Vegas or something. Chuck E. Like, Cheese's, go to Chuck E. Cheese, yeah, Urban so. Air, do some trampolines. <laughs> you know, all kinds of cool stuff you could do with it, but. Um, yeah, but the, the landing on the quarterback thing, it made it, well, I remember when the referees come in, they come in t- during training camp and they explain the new rules and they started talking about this and we were like, well, then how are we supposed to tackle him to the ground? And the refs were like, <laughs> I don't know. That's what they said. They said, we don't know. Figure it out. Just don't land on him. If you land on him, we will throw the flag. Like no matter what, if your body lands on top of his, and we were like, well, what if we like sprawl out and like. You know what I mean? It's like sprawl so out and, stra- and like so you're straddle like, him, you know? Yeah, so you're doing and they like, were like super- no, it doesn't matter. If you land on him, it's over. And then, so you're doing like a plank over him. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what they want you to do is like pick him up and like fall on your back with him on top of you. <laughs> That's kind of what they want. And what oh, was happening man, yeah. is I'd get the guys wrapped up and like go to spin them and they just throw the ball away. So I'm like, I'm missing all these sacks because I can't like bury the guy. Um, and then it, then you, that's the other thing. The more you have to think out there, the the slower you are. And you miss opportunities and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a stupid rule that is changing games, and you see it now where guys are. You're like, how is that a roughing the passer? It's because you can't land on the guy, and it's insane. And then you can't you can't touch his you can't graze his helmet. Like don't even graze it. That's a 15 yard flag. Peyton Manning strikes me as a Miller Light guy. You said he drinks Budweiser. Bud heavy. Really? Yeah. He's a hunter okay. though, man. He's what? He's a hunter. Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. But that that doesn't mean that he uh, no is exclusive to Budweiser. No, but what do you mean he strikes you like a light beer guy? He, if I had, if I looked at Peyton Manning, knowing what I know about Peyton Manning, I'd be like, he drinks Miller Lite, not Budweiser. Huh. Bud Heavies. Okay. Oh, you mean, you don't mean because of, uh, I've had enough current events for today. Uh, not, not even <laughs> not even related to that. Just, uh, Derek. He, he looks like he'd be in a Miller Lite ad. <laughs> Derek Wolf came out, just, just for listeners, uh, Derek Wolf was heavy duty on our radar, and uh, we even wrote about him, um, Wrote about him at our website on the meat eater, meat eater. com because he got in one of those uh, one of those things that happens six times a year, where a person well known in one sphere of the world goes hunting, and then they uh, and then they pay the price on social media with all the uproar and death threats. In your case, you did a mountain lion hunt, yeah. Um. No poaching. No, everything was by the book, man. I did everything by the book. It wasn't yeah. even a paid like outfitting hunt. It was like yeah. a buddy of mine that runs hounds and was like, I said, hey, if you ever have an opening and you want to go, hit me up. Like I'll, I'm just, we can go 45 minutes outside the city and chase lions, you know? Yeah. So um, this is actually my second time having PETA and TMZ and all them guys on my butt, you know, over, over hunting. Cause I, um, I went to New Mexico and did a bison hunt with my bow. Oh, that that got him riled up, and that got him all riled up. And what riled him up really was the picture I posted because I it was a perfect heart shot. So when we get, when we opened that animal up, my arrow was still buried in its heart. So I pulled the heart out, and it was like they didn't like that none. They didn't like that. They didn't like that at all. So they made a big deal about. It. They're like uh, buffalo are ex- they're going extinct. I'm like no, they're, no, they're oh, not. Come on, 
No, they're not. They just don't, people they're don't. Not, it's like it's, it's uneducated. It's, so, it's so beside the point. Like any kind of reality is so beside the point. What's funny is we could do that kind of stuff. Well, in fact, do do that kind of stuff all day long. But it's just like people don't like being surprised. They yeah. know someone somewhere, and they don't like seeing that. That, that they don't like seeing that raw edge in them. Yeah, it surprises them. Yeah, Spe- like if, if you're like famous for something, if you're like an attractive young lady, they're just not gonna like it. Well, it's like, are you surprised? I told Philip Rivers I was going to eat his children. Like, yeah. you're surprised that I'm out bow hunting? <laughs> You'd have to be hungry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. He's, 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 like he's got a bunch of yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, that's another story. That was, I, that was, a, that was hilarious when I said that to him because he, he talked a lot of smack, you know, Phil did. But, but with the lion hunt, the way it went down, man, it was, it was my buddy Alex Nestor. He runs hounds. And he was like, hey, tomorrow we're getting a fresh, we're getting a fresh snow tonight you know, be on call. I'll call you if we find one. I said, listen, I'll be at your house at 530. We're going to go out and do something regardless. So he's like, all right, cool. So I show up and we start, you know, trying to cut tracks, just driving back roads and then found a couple smaller tracks, nothing really worth chasing. Um, a couple females, a couple cubs, a couple smaller males. And what you're really after is this big toms because those big toms are like, uh, they're killing a lot of deer. They're killing a lot of elk. They're killing a lot of sheep. They're killing dogs. They're killing other cubs to get the females back into heat, just like bears do. And they're just bigger. And they're just bigger and cooler and harder to get. So we cut this, we, we come across this track and it's kind of going back and forth from up under the, underneath this guy's cabin. It's going from, from his cabin porch to under this tree. So we go over and look under the tree. There's a half eaten mule deer under there, mm-hmm. big four by four. And we're like, oh, this is the one. You know, his track was huge. I couldn't believe. I was like, they, they, I was like, these things are out here roaming around just in, you know, people's neighborhoods. Pretty. It's not like a. It's a mountain neighborhood. You know what those neighborhoods look like. But still, yeah. it's a neighborhood. Uh, so, so there's public land all around, but where the line had went through was private. So we had to get permission from this guy so we could go through there and and cut his tracks. So we're just like kind of hoping that this guy's not an anti hunter and is down for it. Uh, so we went up and kind of knocked. It was like six in the morning at this point. So I just kind of tapped on the door. I didn't want to like, wake go, up, go up there, bow, bow, bow. Hey, there's a line out here. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So I just kind of tapped on the door and he didn't answer. Nobody came to the door. I didn't see any lights on. So I was like, maybe he's just not home, but there was a truck in the driveway. So I assumed somebody was home. Um, so we left and we were trying to find a phone number to call this guy on. And with, um, you know, with Google and with, you know, the, all these online maps now, you can kind of figure out who owns what property. And we were able to get some of the neighbor's numbers and we started hearing stories about how many lions are actually in this area mm-hmm. causing wreaking havoc. Like this one woman was talking about how last year a couple dogs got eaten and her dog, her dogs are being harassed every night. She's afraid to leave her house at night because there's a lion that comes up and looks in her window um, and just stares at, stares in the window at her little dogs. Per- pervert. Yeah. Like this little, pervert too. little pervert lion, uh-huh. you know, peeping peeping, Tom. yeah. Peeping. Yeah. <laughs> peeping Tom. That, was yeah. that was good. Randall, Dr. Randall. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. Was good. yeah. Like we, that little, we need a little scorecard. Yeah. yeah, there, man. yeah. Zing. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that would hurt him, this podcast. Give a mark for Randall. But shit, we've, it turns out that that's like a dude ranch where this guy, it's like the ranch manager, the guy lives there on this dude ranch. So, uh, we couldn't get a hold of anybody that owned the dude ranch. So finally we drive, we just were like, well, let's drive down and see if we can get around his property and try to catch the tracks, which is going to, it's going to suck because the hiking is like straight up and down. It's mm-hmm. straight cliffs, two feet of fresh snow. It's going to be kind of miserable regardless. So we're like, well, you know, it's going to take us three miles out of our way, but you know, if we want to get him, we got to go now. So we started driving down and here's comes the guy out of his, out of his house, kind of waving at us. He's like, Hey, you guys lion hunters. And we're like, yeah. And he's like, you see these tracks going across my yard? I said, dude, we've been trying to get a hold of you for two hours. And he's like, oh, is that you guys on the porch? And I said, yeah. He's like, oh, I thought it was that lion. <laughs> so he thought the lion, because he said, he's like, there's this big lion that keeps coming up onto my porch and looking in my windows. Really? Huh. And so, so the track, I mean, the tracks went right by his steps, you know? And he's like, did you see how big those tracks are? We're like, yeah. He's like, he's huge. And he's like, we're like, you care if we go after him? He's like, oh, please go get him. Please get him Seriously? out of here. So we, so, you know, we, That's we great, jump out, I, gra- I grab my pack, grab my bow. We let the dogs out and we just go straight up and we, and on the way up, I'm like, I'm starting to slip and slide already. And I'm like, this ain't good. This is going to turn in. I already know what the, hopefully he's treed at the top of this, this mountain already. Like hopefully he was just up there and he's treed already. Well, we get up there and he wasn't, he goes all the way back down the other side, the backside. So we start at like 9,000 feet 
or like 8,900 feet and go all the way up to like 11.2 or something like that. Oh, really? And then drop back That's down on the other side, down into a drainage. And then he runs up this drainage. So at this point, I'm, you know, I'm almost 300 pounds out there and I'm in good shape, but getting through snow and stuff like that, it just takes twice as much energy to get anywhere. Oh, yeah. So I'm like falling behind already, you know, on the way up let alone the way down, which was just like, might as well just sled down. I was just sl- oh, sled yeah. and sliding If you could go down. through snow in my skinny ass little body, you'd be loving it, man. Oh, I'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Just, I just mean, like just like a switch, mountain goat like out there. switch gears. Oh, it was, <laughs> little by pen- the time little I got pencil to- pencil legs <laughs> cutting through that snow, like you wouldn't believe, man. By the time I got to the other <laughs> side of that mountain and was like, I gotta, I was, I just was following the tracks, following uh, Alex and the dogs. I was just following their tracks. So by the time I get to to like halfway down that hill, I had to stop because I was like sweating already. I was um, like starting to like, I don't know. I was, I was starting. I, cause I was like, this is going to be a long day. I already know it. So I get down and I crawled up through all this deadfall and and uh, and the snow at that down in that drainage, you know, it all rolls down there. It was up to my chest pretty much. Hmm. So I just started crawling. I just crawled through it, and he was like, and that you know, lion's cutting across the top of it. Yeah, so more he, or less floating on it. Yeah, he's just floating on it. And the dogs are floating on it, and and then Alex is, you know, he's not. He's like 165, 175 pounds, so he's just kind of floating on it too. But me, every time I take a step, it's just like straight down. So I just started crawling. So I crawled, and he keeps he calls me. He goes, "Where are you at?" And I said, "Dude, I'm. I, I don't even know where. You, I can't hear the hounds anymore. I'm way behind you." And he was like, "All right, we'll just keep following my tracks." He's like, I think they got him. I think they got him treed now about, you know, two miles up here. And I was like, all right, cool. So I keep going. And then he calls me again. He goes, hey, there's a spot where you're going to see where I turned and went to go up the hill and came back down. Just keep going up the hill when you get there. And I'm like, okay. He calls it a hill. No, it's a, it's a straight mountain. Mm -hmm. So I just go straight up that mountain, crawl up there. I get to the top and start walking the ridge following his tracks. He calls me again. He's like, you got to, you know, he starts freaking out. I don't know if you've ever been on these hound hunts. Oh yeah, yeah. It's chaos. He's, he's in, in the background. I can hear the hounds. Burr, burr, burr. He's like, we're going to lose this lion. Where are you at? He's huge. And I was like, dude, I'm coming. Like <laughs> I'm doing everything I can. I'm going as fast as I can at this point. I'm cramping. So I'm now my hamstrings, my quads and my forearms and my like rib cage is like starting to cramp up and I can't like your rib cage is cramping. Yeah. Like all those, like in here, yeah. like the, all those abdomen muscles are starting to lock up on me and I'm like, oh, this ain't good. Um, he goes, all right, I'm going to drop you a pin, come straight to the pin. I'm like, all right. So he drops this pin and I just like haul down. I just like roll down the mountain pretty much just sliding and ripping my pants up and falling all over the place. And cause I can't stand up and walk. Cause if I stand up and walk, I just cramp. I'm just like Charlie horse, Charlie horse, Charlie horse. And then my, I'm like, oh, oh, like my whole body starts locking up. So I just was like, all right, I'm just gonna crawl. So I crawled down backwards down that thing and rolled down it and slid down it as much as I could get to the pin. It's on the road. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> And he, I call him. I was like, "Dude, you dropped me a pin on the road. Are you serious?" He goes, "Oh, you're, you know, we're we're screwed now. You're never getting up here." <laughs> oh my! And I was like, God. "What do you mean?" He's like, "You got to come all the way back up." He's like, "I told you to walk the ridge and drop down on the pin." I said, "No, you didn't. You said come straight to the pin." I said, "All right, I'm not arguing. I'm coming." And this is only like 900 yards that I had to go to get to, to get or 900 feet to get to where he was. Has it been like hours at this point? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's. Yeah, we're I'm four or five hours into this. Like, mm. f- like it just took so long to get anywhere. And I look up, and I still it, – it's in this cut. So it's a big cut like this, and it's just dead fall everywhere and little cliffs and stuff. And I'm like, all right, here we go. So I just crawled my way up there. It took me about an hour and a half to get <laughs> to get up there. And I get up there, and um, I hear – you know, right the, – the, he's got the hounds, and he's like, you're almost there, buddy. Keep coming. And I, I turn and look, and I look up, and there's a lion sitting right above me in a tree. <sighs> doing that and i was like oh oh man he's huge i was like i can't believe how big he is and i was like can i just shoot him here and he's like no he's gonna fall on you i was like i can't move man i'm done and there's a video of me on if you look on my instagram or uh even on my youtube channel of uh, there's he took a he had his phone out taking a video of me standing up in that moment and you could see on my face i'm just pale white i'm just look like defeated right and i'm like i just wouldn't give up though so i just kept going and i had to go like 10 more yards to get to him and I just got up and made my way up to him. And uh, he was facing me. The lion was facing straight at me in that tree. So I had to do a frontal on him. And I was like, all right, it's time to send one. And he was like, put it right above this little white spot. And I was like, all right. I put it right on that white spot. And he fell out of the tree. And I just, boom, fell to the ground. And I was just like, I'm done. I was like, I hope, I hope he doesn't come up here because I can't fight back right now. 
<laughs> and he's like, all right, give him a minute. And we didn't hear any movement. So he's like, all right, I'm gonna go down there and check it. So he goes down there. He's like, we got a dead lion. You know, he goes, starts freaking out. And he's like, let the hounds come down. So I had to like un- unhook those. Yeah, and it yeah. took me forever because every movement was like, and then I start thinking, how am I going to get him out of here? How am I going to get this lion out of here? So I let the dogs go and go down there. And he's like, Where you? hurry up, get down here. And I'm just like trying to take my time, you know? So I crawl backwards down there. When I say backwards, I'm on my hands and knees crawling backwards down the hill, slipping and sliding down, you know, and grabbing trees to hold me. And finally we get to it. And I couldn't believe how big he was. Could not believe. I was like, this thing could drag me by my neck mm-hmm. up a tree if it wanted to. And he goes... We got to get a picture of this thing. He's like, he's like, set your stuff over here and let's take a picture of him. And I was like, dude, forget the picture, man. Let's get him out of here. And he's like, no, no, no. He's huge. He's one of the biggest lions I've ever seen. He's been hunting lions for, you know, 15 years. So he, he's, he knows what he's talking about. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I go to pick this thing up and I grab it around the belly and I lift it up. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, this thing is like 200 pounds. He's like, no, nah, he's probably like 170, 165. And I'm like, dude, I know what 200 pounds feels like. This thing's 200 plus, I'm telling you. And he's like, yeah, whatever. And I get him up and then he's in the head just like flops right onto my forehead. And it, and I'm like, gee, you know, you can't even see my face. And he goes, flop his head to the side. So I like, uh, like nudged his head over and boom, he's, that's the picture. The famous picture. I snap, that he snapped of me right there. And then I just dropped him and he comes over. Let me feel this thing. He could hardly pick it up. He's like, oh man, he is heavy. So we gutted him out. And I just laid him across. I have a Kafaru Striker XL pack and it has like a meat hanger on it. So yep. I just like hung that lion across that. So the tail, it's eight and a half feet long. So the tail's hanging out one end and the head's hanging out the other end. And there's also a video of, the, of me doing that, trying to get over this deadfall. And you can see I'm just like wrecked. He goes, heavy, huh? And I'm like, yeah, it's heavy. I was like, I pack elk out and everything, you know, put 150, 160 pounds of elk meat, you know, with a skull and and antlers and really don't have a problem. This is like, I'm struggling with this. So I did the same thing. He's like, I'm going to get the dogs down here because they're wore out, you know? So he just takes off. He doesn't even help me. He just takes off. So I strap my bow to my packs, you know, with the lion in there and get in and I start crawling down backwards (laughs) with this lion just like dragging on, you know, it's, it's just dragging all over the place. And I get to this, uh, I thought I was taking the same path that I took up, but I kind of went the wrong way. Uh-huh. And I like, I had to get across this little, this little drop off. It was probably 10 foot drop off. And I was like, I got to walk across this now. And when I say I took one step and just foot feet came right out from under me, shroom. And I was like, I just put my arms across my body and accepted my fate at that point. I was like, I'm like who knows what I'm going to land on. And luckily I landed like right underneath this tree and it was just soft. And I was just super lucky um, that I landed right there because, like, all around me is deadfall. Yeah, yeah. And I could have gotten paled or something. But I fell off that thing, and it, and then I had to repack the lion on this slope, you know. I had to repack him in there because all, it was all screwed up. So I repacked him, and I come crawling down out of there. It took me, like, an hour and a half to get down out of that and finally got him to the truck, sat him on the truck, and was just like, oh, God. I was like, I can't, I can't believe that took six, like, it was like six and a half hours up there just getting my, just getting my butt kicked. Sure, yeah, You're like, yeah. next time I'm going to bring some electrolytes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I did. I did. I mean, oh, I drank electrolytes oh, and everything, right. but the problem, the thing is when you get to that altitude, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, it just sucks it right out of you. Uh, you know, plus, you know, it's cold. So you have to have, you know, some mm-hmm. cold gear on. So I got a puffy on and, and everything, but it wasn't like, I couldn't really take it off. Because then I'm already sweating, so now I'm going to freeze if I take it off. So I just, like, accepted my fate at that point. And we jumped in the truck, and the funny thing was is I, I, was, uh, I was, like, two hours late for my radio show that I do, a sports radio show. I was, like, two hours late for my show, and they're like, where are you at? And I'm like, I sent them a uh, picture of me. Plug the show. Tell people what you do. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's a sports radio show. It's 104.3 The Fan. Uh, we're the number one sports show in, in Denver. Um, so we just talk all things sports. Um, I'm, I'm doing that and I'm also doing a pod, my own podcast. I just launched my first episode. Um, it's the Wolf Untamed podcast and then I'm doing a hunting show as well. And we just started launching episodes from my first, um, fall out of football, you know, hunting, bow hunting and, um, turkey hunting, stuff like that. Uh, that's called Wolf Untamed. It's on YouTube as well. So you can check us out on Spotify. Um, then you can also on denversports.com, you can watch, you can watch the show. It's pretty funny. Like we have a good time. Um, it's really like a comedy show. We're just goofing around the whole time. Oh, I should point out the. Um, can I point that out? What? 
Yes, please. Who said that? That was Phil. You Phil, you got to get a new son, <laughs> um, man. Yeah, I'll get a It's driving me crazy. <clears throat> was that a genuine question here? about who said that? <laughs> I can't tell because it's, it's the way, he's got, the all, stupid, of he's got uh-huh. all the stupid things back there. Oh, that's a good way to can't put tell it. What's going on. I used to look Phil mm-hmm. dead in the face. Yep. Dead in the face. I could tell what he was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't even see this. I mean, I honestly guy cannot see Phil. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's so distracting. Oh, there's his hand sticking up. <laughs> Cal was thinking we'd put a little so heart monitor, that, like a heart monitor up in the corner so he could at least tell like his vital signs. You could do like a little live feed on the on the TV there. Speaking of the, okay, that was a great segue. You can watch what we're doing right now on YouTube. Phil's got it all rigged up. It's become Phil's like passion project. Yeah, this this is being not, filmed not right now. Off. That's right. <laughs> I wish we could see Phil's face. You know, well, I know, because you think a guy, if you, you think a guy that that was that liked to do that was a thespian. <laughs> you know what that means, Phil? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> a, an actor of st- stage and screen. You think a thespian like Phil would be like jumping up and down at his big chance to like be broadcast on yet another platform. Yeah, it makes me a little uncomfortable, but I do have, there is a Phil Because he doesn't want to be associated. I bet he's beaming back there. He doesn't want to be associated. <laughs> it's kind well, of fun to just imagine what he's doing. The viewers can see I just cut to the Phil cam. It exists. Mm. You, you guys can't oh, see Oh, you're on the though. Phil cam right I'm now? I'm on the Phil cam right now. <laughs> <laughs> Go yeah. camera four. You're Dude. actually wrong, Steve. He's he's the only one who has their own camera on him. You oh, and Phil. So, yeah. so there is the band. That's a good right. point, Spencer. This, this mm-hmm. And the, the reason he's hidden back there is because he's probably like got like his face powder on mm-hmm. and it's like he's got his makeup on. <laughs> a little eyeliner. He doesn't want everybody to tease him. Uh we're gonna we're gonna dig back into uh we're gonna we're I want we are gonna dig back into more of the more because we, we we gotta get not that was the good part of the story. Yeah. Yeah, that the was other, the, good part. the other garbage is whatever part of the story, but that was that was the part I like. Yeah. We, you know, it, it, just real funny. Um, we just did a thing with the. Did you follow the, the Blue Marlin controversy? Those boys that caught that Blue Marlin down in North Carolina and won a big tournament. I didn't follow it, no, okay. but I heard about it. I so, didn't yeah. Pay, pay much attention to it. Roughly, these dudes go out and they join a tournament. And um, they're kind of like they're under, underdogs in the Blue Marlin tournament, but they, they win the Blue. Yeah, they don't win. They catch a big ass Blue Marlin. Th- this episode's already out. People could check it out. Was that filmed? No, that's that's not going to be video. Uh, they catch a big blue marlin, six hundred some odd pounds, but it gets disqualified because it had a little bite mark on it. Oh, because the shark got a, got on it. Shark bit it, so mm-hmm. they lost their three point five million bucks. Oh, we had them on, and one of the things they were uh, appreciative of. This is like a little plug for our show. Is they had done every interview in the world. Who who all they interview with, Corinne? New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, every local paper NPR was NPR. New York Times is doing a piece on them. UK Daily Mail, and, 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 and. All Media's that. website. All that, and he says he's never gotten to talk about the what he imagines is the cool part, is catching the fish. Yeah. <laughs> talk about the, the <laughs> no worst part about, about catching the fish. <laughs> and it's a crazy story about catching the fish. No one cares about catching the fish. Yeah, they just so they were like, the thanks, because... We finally got to tell about catching the damn fish, <laughs> which was amazing, right? That's a huge fish. I well, actually, it's, it's now that you're telling me, I, I saw the picture of the fish, but I didn't see where that was like. It's superficial, dude. Where it had a bite on it's it. I didn't even see it. You know what? Um, if you go, if folks can go back and listen to this. Uh, they didn't even know. Because when they pulled the, they, they pulled the fishes, they, when they pulled the fish up, I think they pulled up the. The fish is starboard side, and they couldn't see the port side of the fish. That's how it's like. They didn't even know. Yeah, they didn't even know. They pulled it up. You can't like you said. You can't roll these things around. It wasn't even. They weren't even. Then uh, later he was like aware of it, but didn't even give it any thought. It's just like a mark. Yeah, and he said about heartbreak. <laughs> oh, it is crazy. <laughs> Joined also by Bill Vander Hayden. How's it going, man? Good. See, you doing? missed a good transition there. Oh, what should I have done? Uh, you should ask Derek what broadhead he used. I was going to do hunt. that and I forgot about it. Okay, what broadhead did you use? I was using a, an iron wheel. You were? Yeah. Oh. Do you know Bill Pryor? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you guys have met. You yeah, guys are in the same state. Before. Yeah. I was, I've been shooting iron wheels for a while now. Really? So We met at the Colorado Bow Hunters. Yeah. Hey, Bill, stay close to your mic. We met at the Colorado Bow Hunters Association. So how's, how's things been going at Iron Wheel, man? Good. Good. Been busy. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, appreciate you guys having me on last year doing that podcast on uh, physics, fate, and physics and fatality. I think it was called, but yeah, I got a lot of interest in in us from that. So appreciate it. Oh, that's good. Um, you know, what I wanted to ask you. Do you? Uh, I guess you probably wouldn't know this because you can't tell. That if people that listen to the show, <clears throat> this is like a, I guess this is a marketing question. People that listen to the show and came to you from having heard the show. Did they, uh, did they seem to be, um, like mostly Western elk hunters or were you hearing from like whitetail hunters and whatnot? Yeah. Good question. I think a lot of the Western like elk hunters had kind of already heard of us. Yep. Um, so I think a lot of the people were more Midwest or even Eastern whitetail hunters. Like we went to Pennsylvania total archery challenge event. I had a lot of people come up to the booth there say they heard the Meat Eater podcast. And also at Den- we were down in a, at a Dallas show and a lot of people there as well down in Texas. Got it. Yeah. Man, I, uh, I, had, a, I had an opportunity to use your broadheads hunting whitetails last winter and phenomenal. And my, my friend I was hunting with, we were both using them. And um, they work on elk, right? Uh, but what's cool about this is we're now, you can now come and find, in addition to coming to our store and finding First Light gear, finding FHF gear, Phelps Game Calls, uh, soon to be DSD. You can also now uh, come and find, uh, you know, th- those are those are our, like those are our brands. This is not, but you, we, we're now able to carry Iron Will Broadheads on our website. Can you tell, tell folks what they can find on our website? Yeah, we're going to launch here with uh, the, our S-Series broadheads, our S-100, which is what you and uh, and Jason used on your elk hunt in New Mexico, yep. um, along with our S-125, two of our very popular heads. Um, and then our new our new head for this year, which is a wide, single-bevel, 150-grain head, which is our, our one new broadhead that we just launched. So those are going to be the, the three options uh, there. A yeah. yeah. And yeah, you guys have been using our heads for a while, and we appreciate all the help you've done, you know, helping spread the word. So I think it's yeah, a great partnership. Oh, that's great, man. You got a big old bear this spring? I did. Yeah. I got a, a giant bear up in really? Saskatchewan. What was going on with that? You know, I've, I've been going there for a few years and seeing big bears occasionally. And, um, and man, each year I kind of see a bigger one. And this, this guy, when he was coming through, so he weighed 473 pounds. Oh, really? Yeah. 21 inch skull, just, just oh, a yeah? tank. And, you know, I see now, a lot what, of bears. What's the, what's the Boone and Crockett cutoff? Is it 21 or 20? I 20. think it's 20. 20 for the yearly and uh, 21 for the all-time. Okay. Um, and has, your, has yours dried yet? No, so he might not make the all-time. He might shrink. Just dry him in a bucket of water. That's a trick Phelps. <laughs> yeah, is it? <laughs> 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 but yeah, I heard, I'm sitting in the stand. Oh, I, Phelps did not tell me that trick. <laughs> <laughs> you could do the, uh, the Phelps be- the told Beatles me that too. joke. Phelps told me that joke, not that trick. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles too. I guess the beat like there's a Beatle process. Oh yeah, Dermifted. Yeah. What's that Beatle called? Dermisted. Dermisted Beetle. Carrion Beetle. Mm-hmm. That shrinks it less? Yeah. Yeah, it helps shrink it less. Yeah, I used Beatles really? actually on this one. Yeah. Man, I used to hang out with the dude that had one of them Beetle works. <laughs> this just the like the like a <laughs> and there's a ways to control it, but that is a smell that you can't find no. anywhere else, man. If you it could was... bottle that smell and squirt it out of a can, you can clear a room. <laughs> That's funny. The outfitter up there had beetles, so we oh really? Threw the guy he had his own. He had his own, hmm. so we oh, threw it cool. in there right away. Um, and then like a day or two later, we just went in there to check on it. And three of the guys that were there on the hunt started gagging just by going in that room. So. <laughs> sure, man. <laughs> it's an insane smell in that room, man. Yeah. Uh, so what's going to happen with that? You know, what are you going to get a big old rug made out of? it? I think what? I'm going to do a big bear rug, put it up in the in our shop there, on the wall. How far apart are you guys? Because you're in Colorado, right? Yeah, we're about an hour and a half. I'm, yeah. I'm north up, uh, I'm near Loveland up near Fort Collins, yeah. uh, Estes Park area, and you're down a little south of Denver. Yeah. Well, when I did my book event in Denver the other day, I sure didn't see you waiting in line. Mm. Well, I didn't even know about it, so. <laughs> uh, I, guess it's, I guess it's the marketing people's fault. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> they told me. As an engineer, did you have extra interest in the uh, submarine story or not? You know, I did. I wanted to hear the just review kind of what went wrong there uh-huh. and um yeah from an engineering standpoint i mean the engineers were involved they sh- if there were engineers involved they should have known no you shouldn't do that 
you know, it doesn't meet a factor of safety. Well, he didn't want he didn't want to hear it. about any of that. Yeah, he fired no, his head he engineer, did. didn't he? Didn't he fire the head engineer? Yeah. I get where he's coming from, man. He was like an anti-regulation guy, you know? Which is one thing, but the minute you're selling the trip, it's a different thing. Well, and it worked like 40 other times. It was like the 41st yeah, time. Yeah, but you know how many it, times that Alvin, you know, you know, that Alvin submersible? You know how many trips the Alvin submersible's done? Mm-mm. 4,100. It's a good track mm-hmm. record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So talking about how, I, oh, we've done it a uh-huh. times. It's like 4,100. Yeah. And it can go deeper. Check me out, man. I'm like no, a sub expert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was really curious to, to see if you actually had a number in mind or if you were just the asking. Yeah, you know, yeah. the first thing. Like everybody else, like I always like the joke that like everybody in Montana is a grizzly bear expert. It's so like everybody in America is a submersible mm-hmm. expert oh, yeah. now, man. And then there were a, a Russian coup expert. Yeah. yeah, right. Oh no, but I am an expert on that. Okay, <laughs> we're joined by two of them today in the room here. It's great. You know, there's that great quote that uh um how war war i don't know i wish i remember how it went war is how americans learn geography mm-hmm. right? yeah yeah um tell me about the aero flight deal you guys are working on bill yeah so i sponsored a study with the university of colorado um i've worked with them for quite a few years i've been a adjunct instructor in mechanical engineering um, helping out with the senior design class for mechanical engineering and this year, um, got approved to, or this past year, got approved to sponsor a project and direct it, where we had a team of seniors in mechanical engineering. And the project was on improved arrow vein design for bow hunting, you know, mm-hmm. for arrows with broadheads on the front. So there's really a limited amount of scientific research on arrow flight when there's a broadhead on the front. And the aerodynamics are, are much different there than, than say, a field point. Because it's cutting um, the air ahead of it different, right? Yeah, it's cutting the air ahead of it different. There's different pressure on the size of it when it's when there's some angle of attack, you know, when it tips a little bit off of off of straight forward. So, and you know, I feel pretty strongly that a, a durable fixed blade head, sharp, with good edge retention, is is such a better option than a mechanical. Um, but there's a couple couple. Pro- problems people might have is is one might be arrow flight long range with that you know they're not as forgiving as a field point or a small mechanical um in my own testing i found out but you could be very effective shooting fixed blade heads long range with the right arrow setup and a tune bow and you know, a couple other things but um but i wanted to sponsor a kind of an independent industry test where these guys weren't even you know they're not even bow hunters they're just following the science and setting up experiments and running them to really show that you can be very effective um, in accuracy, stability with fixed blade heads at distance with, with enough arrow vein. And we studied like six of the veins, top veins in the industry, along with some prototypes. Um, you know, had some great results there. We, we looked at drag, um, stability, accuracy, spin up, wind drift, and sound. Hmm. And we had a computation of fluid dynamic modeling, you know, so a computer model modeling the flow over the broadhead. Um, and the full arrow there. And then um, and we could study all these things there. We could tip the arrow at, say, five degrees. Let's say the bow is not tuned or you torque a little bit and look at how much restoring force is there. How well do these veins pull it back on quickly, Got it. back on track? Um, and then we used a shooting machine and a lot of equipment. So we had lab radar looking at speed and drop, so drag we could get from that. We had a high-speed camera looking at spin up and looking at how quickly arrows got stabilized. Um, we had a sophisticated sound system where we recorded sound of the arrow coming at it, crossing over it, um, and then analyzed the frequency content. Mm-hmm. Like, would it be loud to a person? Would it be loud to a, an animal? So resulting from all that, we found um, a, a particular vein that performed the best. And then um, I worked with Easton to get these machine fletched at three degree helical. So now we sell these as well. So we get so many customers asking, you know, what's a good arrow for us to use see that. for good accuracy? you know, with your broadheads. So I can say, you know, we have this scientific study now that shows these do a great job of quickly stabilizing an arrow and giving you good accuracy, you know, with fixed blade heads. And that's a textured vein. Yeah, there's like waves in it. See, I hate kind of stuff like this because now I want to have this. It's like, Cal was bringing up like how he used to just love ice fishing. Always had a great time ice fishing. And then better electronics come out and some guy shows up with that and you're like, we're fucked now. (laughs) <laughs> you know <laughs> like you're like now it's not now we're not gonna do any good because he's got something better that's pretty cool though hmm 
Let's see that. So was this study, did it uh, like compare it against field points and mechanicals or what were the broadheads that were being used? We, we used um, iron wheel broadheads in the study, but we compared them to field points. So what we looked at was like for, for accuracy, we use a bow that's out of tune. So, you know, a bow, a bow in tune means basically when it leaves your bow, it's, it's going in a straight line, you know, at the target. The knock's pushing directly in line, the arrow comes off straight. That's really what a tuned bow means. Uh, an untuned bow, like we would take it out of tune so that it would come out, say, tail left, right out of the bow. Dude, when we were young, we just thought it was like just the, the how it was that your arrow fishtailed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that your arrow fishtailed for 15 yards. <laughs> it was just the reality. <laughs> It was like a comforting feeling to see it just kind of fishtail out, eventually straighten yeah. out. You know? Yeah, well, with like a long bow or something where you're not cut to center, the bow is the arrow is going to have to you know flex around the riser, and there's a special. Oh, yeah, I got. It'd be like a perfect stiffness to get that to go straight. Is that the archer's there? paradox? It is. Okay, yeah. yeah, we named the episode that one time. Right. Yeah, yeah, I listened to that one. Yeah, you had a problem with that one. I did. <laughs> a lie. <laughs> yeah, you wonder why. Whenever I hear things that defy the laws of physics, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta speak up. <laughs> Something deep in your brain goes off. A lot of a lot of those like modern recurves and stuff are cut like when I was building them, like an eighth pass center or or center cut. Um, but then there's you know problems with strong risers, you know. A lot goes into it. <laughs> yeah, with, with recurves and using fingers, there's just a lot more happening there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a compound, you can really adjust your rest and, you know, your bow set up so that your knock's getting pushed, your string's pushing your knock in a straight line and the arrow's coming straight off the bow. Um, some people some people teach different ways to tune, but I mean, that's really the best, having your arrow coming perfectly straight. And, you know, that's how you're going to achieve the best flight. But really this study, I know nobody's perfect and a lot of people aren't great at tuning their bow. So part of this study was, okay, if your arrow's not coming straight off your bow, it's actually coming out tail left. Um, one of the tests we do is we'll just shoot a fletch shaft versus a bear shaft, it's say 30 and 40 yards. Because a, a bear shaft, and, and we'll add some tape maybe to get the weight the same. Um, but a bear shaft will come out tail left and then it'll just stay that angle and it'll end up hitting right oh, on the really? target out there. Yeah. That's in Yeah, of course, right? Nothing's pulling it back. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. a great way to test, yeah. is my bow really tuned or not? Take a bear shaft versus a fletch shaft, just with field points, I'd say 30 yards. 30 yards is pretty good. 40 yards, um, and, and you do it a few times. If they're not hitting like the same, then it means you know your form or something else is wrong with your bow. But, so, yeah, I don't know why it, it never occurred to me, but yeah. Yeah, it's a great it, with test. With no fletching, it's never gonna recover, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So in this study, we had it so that a, a, a bear shaft was hitting a foot right of a fletch shaft at 40. So this is way out of tune, really. Um, even with that. With in that case, is the knock on? Is the knock lined up or is the center of the arrow lined up? Like, what is on target? I mean, if you, if you shot it, no fletching, and it kicks left, and it just stays like that and goes in, and then you're standing from your perspective, some part of your arrow is going to cross the bullseye. Maybe like center shaft. When you're looking at it. Is that not true or is that true? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of difficult when it's tip, when it's tipped at an angle to like basically the the wind direction at that point. Yep. Um it ends up <clears throat> with the veins it will just quickly get get put straight back on. Yeah. Um you know without it it's it's probably tipping back a little bit towards it but um yeah, what part? I mean, the whole arrow was kind of getting thrown at the bullseye, but it's going to end up drifting right just because of the way the airflow is and the pressure. Also, oh, the whole arrow it. will drift right. Not to, okay, I got you. Yeah, yep. yeah. It'll continue on that drifting path. Yeah, so what yeah. you'll see is your um, fletched arrow might be in the bullseye, but your your bear shaft will be, in this case, it was a foot right, and you can see the back of the arrow is, is tipped tail. I guess that's my question. The knock there. is right, too, because it yeah. drifted, because the arrow drifted. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. You following um, that question, Dr. Randall? No. They didn't teach you that in that uh, doctor school. Archery they? is uh, uh, an area of profound ignorance <laughs> in my world. <laughs> so what vein setups were you all testing? Did you have like four veins and uh, did you have three inch? Did you test any like of the fobs that have become sexy in the last few years? Uh, we didn't test the fobs. We had, um, let's see, we had uh, Blazers, Max Hunters, Max Stealth, um, Silent Knights. 
Feathers? Just throw a, tur- just throw a turkey shaver. feather into the mix just for fun. <laughs> I've tested uh, feathers you? in the past, have you? and yeah. they are so loud. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think people realize that. It's funny oh, when. Oh yeah, man. It's funny I've, when re- I've watched the movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when people will say like, "Oh, that's you know that's a loud head or something," and then they're shooting feathers. I'm like. Hey, I can show you the data that shows that those feathers are so much louder than anything else. Uh, Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. How did you, uh, w- what's the reason for the, the textured, when I say textured, the veins rippled. It looks like a stingray fillet for you, you just to draw a very vivid image. <laughs> Who you know? knows what that looks like? <laughs> Would it be more drag? Yeah. You know, we, um, to be honest, I don't know why that made this a little better. Um, we really tested did. kind of with and without, but when we, when we looked at all the results and we, we, you know, we looked at drag, drag and sound were reduced with these um, ridges hmm. and this particular really? vein material. Are you guys selling just the veins or you got to buy the whole damn We area? are. We're selling the veins too. Like, just you know, bring like, a little pile of them? Uh, I didn't. <laughs> I could ship you some. <laughs> I might have any so it'd be, veins. it's less drag with the, the little ripples in those veins. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like, I'm not sure if this is applicable, but you know, a, a golf ball has little dimples in it. It'll mm-hmm. change like the airflow over it and the turbulence. And that's an improvement. Um, sure. Yeah, oh, they used to play golf with no dimples. Well, I don't know if they did, but I know dimples in the golf ball make it, you know, go further. It changes the airflow they across did? it. Yeah. They did play with a smooth ball. I think it was an accident when they stumbled on that the, uh, like dimples made a difference. So. We need those dimples to make it go straight now. If I could just keep the ball straight, I mean, I'll drive it 400 every time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's interesting, though. So, but when you got, here's my question about the researchers. You had to fund it. I did, yeah. Hmm. But since I'm the director, they they pay me too. Got it. To direct it, so it it worked out pretty good. And then... uh, because you weren't previously make you weren't previously making a fletching, so you didn't have you weren't in there with a bias. No, um, and I I really just wanted to like be able to say to our customers, we get so many questions about what vein should I use and how will this vein work, and so I wanted to study them all in this testing, and now I have all the data, and I can say, yeah, this vein vein works pretty good. This one has a little more drag, but it's fine. Um, so it was really that's that was the reason for the study. And then, um, I worked with AAE that, that made, um, some of the veins that were in the study and just got ribbon material from them so that we could laser cut different shapes in them. Got and, it. and they sent me materials with different stiffnesses, different, you know, with and without ribbing, things like that. So we had a bunch of things to prototype and test as well. And we found this one that, um, it did a great job with accuracy, stability, but then reduced drag and sound. And, you know, I can have my bow out of tune, I currently have my bow out of tune, you know, four, it's hitting four inches right, four to five inches right at 40. So just a little out of tune, not terrible. But I can hit the same point of impact with broadheads and field points out to 100 yards with a bow a little out of tune with this vein on it. You know, Got it just it. does a great mm. job stabilizing. So when I was seeing that, I'm like, I just decided we're just going to, you know, offer this vein as well as a, a fletched arrow to customers that want it. How much do you shoot? How much do you shoot field points, man? I shoot them. I shoot field points and rod heads typically, you know, t- together like every day. Do you just, do you, but I mean, are you shooting them just to save on, cause you know, you know, I got a feeling you got a good line on broad heads. Are you shooting them just to save on targets? Uh, it saves on targets. I don't chew up targets as yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, um, I don't need to shoot. Well, if I'm shooting groups at distance, um, I still wreck, I still wreck things if I shoot three broad heads, you know, so I'm cutting veins. Um, hitting one broadhead into another. So sure, part yeah, of it yeah. is if I'm going to shoot a group at 80 yards, I'll shoot one broadhead and two field points. Yeah. If I mean, I know, hitting, why, I know why I shoot them. I was just curious to fell in your position while you're shooting, <laughs> but you still, you still, you still don't like just destroy everything you own all the time. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I want to, I like to shoot a lot just to keep in practice and be able to, you know, if I, I find just shooting daily um, or maybe skip a day here and there, but just shooting a lot, I just keep my form consistent. But yeah, there's no need to shoot broadheads all the time. Did the college already have an arrow shooter? No, no. So I pl- supplied like a it's a, a Hooter shooter is the name of the machine, mm-hmm. but it's a, a shooting machine. Um, 
And we got the lab radar. And so we got some of the equipment they needed there for the test. You know, Kent State University that we sure. did the- uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were talking to them about doing uh, some other fun projects. Uh, they don't have one Hooter shooter. They have two Hooter shooters that they use for their experiments. Hmm. So if you ever need I always think that that would be like a, a shot that you'd get at Hooters. <laughs> 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 if I heard that. <laughs> it could be. Uh, speaking of, you know, he just sent me, um, Matt and Aaron just sent me a, a pretty interesting academic article that has to do with, like, you know how, how Clovis points, why they're so mesmerizing and why people are so fixated on them and, and like, you know, for a fellow such as yourself, not that you have one, but tattoos, paintings, people, you can lay out a bunch of, uh, you can lay out a bunch of stone projectile points and people are going to point to that one. Mm. Hmm. And it's, it's, what is the art? Like, what is the artistic merit? Right. So, so they talk to all these art and design people to be, um, and then some people say it's so beautiful that it must have been part of its design must have been its beauty. Like there's aspects of it that don't make sense from a functional standpoint. Like why would you go through all the hassle? It must have been that they knew that it was beautiful. They knew that it was art. So this paper, I, I read the, what do you call it up top? I read the abstract. abstract. Yeah, basically. Doctor knew that one. Yeah. Basically, why are Clovis points so, like why do songwriters want to write songs about Clovis points and they're not writing songs about uh, I don't know, all the other ones. Do you, do you share that same sentiment? No, I've never written a song about those. No, no, no. Oh. That, like aesthetically, <laughs> aesthetically, they're the most pleasing. I wrote a song about Dr. Randall. Uh, oh, you did? About Yanni. Someone... I wrote a song about Yanni. My song about Dr. Randall is about how he can't actually prescribe drugs, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Someone sent um. in another song. <laughs> Based on your song, to Roman, he shared oh, it with good. me the other day. Excellent. But uh, what, do do I share the idea that there's something about them? Yeah, they're like oh, aesthetically, absolutely. they're the most pleasing. Oh, absolutely. The, yeah. There's something there. There's mm -hmm. something there. There's something that appeals to the modern. There's something that appeals to the modern eye. Yeah. Bill, man, I'm glad we get. I'm glad you're letting us uh, be a. I don't know. You call it a dealer to use that word. Um. Yeah. I guess that you're letting us carry your, some of your products on our site, man. Yeah, you'll be the. The one and only. Seriously? That's, really? Yeah, that's selling them besides us, you know, online. Yeah. Damn. Are we going to sell the uh, veins? Do you guys? Um, you can. Oh. I don't think it's set up to do it initially. But Better hustle now because people are going to be wanting those veins. Right. <laughs> and arrows too, if you want to. I'm yeah. get. yeah, I'm going to get some of those veins for sure. Huh. Well, thanks for coming out, man, All, as always. Tell me about the new, tell me again about the new head you got. Yeah, so it's a wide single bevel. Uh, we came out with single bevel broadheads. Yeah, sell me real quick on, I know we've talked about this, but sell me again on, when people argue about single or double, is it just mental masturbation or, or what? What do you think on it? Well, they are different, but sure. they both perform really well. But when you, when you do, because you're looking at things, you're looking at things empirically, right? You're not just being like, I got a nice, I got a huge bowl with this, so it must be the best. I mean, what? tell me. Yeah, so from an from a science from a from a engineering perspective, what are you getting and not getting? What are you sacrificing and not sacrificing? And also tell people what the hell single bevel means. Yeah, so a single bevel versus double bevel. Um, the edge itself um, on a single bevel, it's all ground from one side of the blade. So the other side of the blade is just flat, and all the grind is on on one side. Like some super fine, high quality sushi knives are single bevel. But if you open your knife drawer, all your shit's double bevel. Pretty much everything's double bevel. Yeah. And there's a, yeah, they grind from both sides of the blade to come together and make a sharp point. Um, oh, you know what? Your ice auger is single bevel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's about it. Things that shave. <laughs> I think there's like oh, cheese things knife. Things that shave? Things that shave where they're okay. just wanting to push. Oh, yeah. Like your razor that you shave with in the morning, right? Single or double? I think those are, I think those are single. Okay. Yeah. But like if you take a double bevel, and put it down through a block of cheese, it's going to go straight. If you're going to like cut it in half, it'll go straight. But if you have a single bevel knife and put it down through like a block of cheese, it's going to push off to the side because that pressure will make it want to push yeah, off. Yeah, and when you get to the end of the block, you got a big old curvy cheese block. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So um, what happens when that goes through an animal is all that pressure on one side 
Um, and and you what you do is you grind, um, you know, say the left side on the top and the right side on the bottom of the blade, so that when it goes through an animal and all the pressures on those bevels, it creates a rotation mm-hmm. of the broadhead through the animal. So, and you think that that's true? That is true. It's yeah. not just in theory. No, that's that's true. I mean, we've we've done it with high speed video. We've looked at it going through different mediums, going through animals as well, and we do see that it does rotate. There's some great YouTube videos where uh, guys will shoot a single bevel versus a double bevel through like a a shoulder blade okay. right, of a critter. And when you see the, uh, maybe I'm understanding this wrong, but when you see the this double bevel go through, it looks like the footprint of the broadhead. Like it looks like you could just shove that thing through sure, there and yeah, you know yeah. exactly what happened there. With the single bevel though, it's like a hole. It's like a drill went through there and you don't quite uh, see the outline of the broadhead as much, right? That's okay, right. well, hold on, hold on, now. Let's say you're passing that arrow through a 150 pound whitetail. Yeah. Okay. And you hit it behind the shoulder or wherever the hell. You hit it anywhere you want. How many rotations is it, is it actually going to get done? That's a good question. Not much, really. It's like maybe one. Um, it okay. depends a little bit what it goes so through. So it's not like a drill. So it's not like a drill. But right. but when you look at the the shoulder blade, one looks like uh, is like the size of a shot glass, right? And the other one, like I said, it's like the footprint of the broadhead is, is how they look. Mm-hmm. Well, we see this through the hide. Do you believe and, and you're right? What's that? Do you agree with him? It does change the shape of the hole. Okay. You know, we see this through hide that with a single bevel um, or with a double bevel, you're pretty much getting a cross cut. Say you have bleeders, so you got a cross blade. Yep. You're pretty much just getting that that cross cut through the hide and through the tissue, organs, whatever. With a, with a single bevel, with that rotation, and I like a single bevel with bleeders, and we also do that single bevel grind on the bleeders because I like a cross cut anyway to kind of open up holes. But if you do that and it rotates, now the entrance and exit holes through the hide, they're almost square. Um, they are more rounded, even though, as you mentioned, there's not a ton of rotation. It's not like a drill, but it seems like twisting the hide or tissue as it's cutting does change the whole shape like that. Got it. And you can see it through through lungs, liver, whatever too. Hmm. It's got a little different shape to it. And cor- correct me if I'm wrong. When you're shooting a single bevel, it's pretty important to match up. Like, uh, let's say you got a left wing feather, you want a a left bevel on your on your single bevel broadheads, so right. it doesn't spin the opposite way. You want right. them spinning the same. That way. is very important. Yep. You want your arrow. Well, you want it to be rotating to begin with, so you don't want straight fletched. You want some. I like two or three degrees offset or helical on your veins to create some rotation of the arrow. You know, that kind of helps average out in any asymmetries in there if you can get the thing to spin on the way there. Yeah, it's and like then, when I'm throwing a big old spiral, man. Derek knows what I'm talking <laughs> yeah, about. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and then on when imp- Spencer goes out for the bomb. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then on impact, you want it to just keep rotating the same way it was going, not have to like stop and rotate the other direction. That would lose energy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We do have a video on our YouTube channel. So you got to be cognizant of that and line that up. Wait. Well, or is it always a, or is it always that same twist? Yeah, you don't have to really line anything up. It's just the way you fletch. If you're like the arrows we sell are right fletch. Well, so what I'm saying, but do you ever see a guy that has his deal rigged up where he's got a right spin on the fletching and a left spin on the bevel, but doesn't realize it? Uh, yeah, once in a while. Okay. And we have some, we, we have like a YouTube video just explaining how to figure out if you got a right or left fletch and and a right or left single bevel, just so people can make sure they match the two yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a period in time, like uh, like the 1980s, when everything was double bevel? Did like single bevel uh, become popular more recently? You know, I think there was always been some very thin, you know, cheaply made blades that were single bevel because it's cheaper to make them that mm. way. Um, and a lot of those are made on these like reel to reel metal stamping machines where a coil of there's a coil of steel on one end, and the blades are coming out the other. Mm-hmm. And they, if they can just grind one side, it's a quick way to do it. So there are some, I think it's always been used kind of in industry and some products where it's a very thin blade and it's want to be really cheaply made. Um, so I think it's always shown up somewhat because of that. Here's a dumb question. Could you have a, uh, a three blade broadhead that's single bevel? You could, there are a few out there. Really? That do that. Why, why would you want to do that? Um, Again, you could get a little rotation with it. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's if you're doing a reel to reel, it's probably cheaper to make the blade. Okay. Um, so it might be. I mean, that's a driving. That's a driving factor for a lot of broadheads mm. out there. Is 
how cheap can I make this thing? Um, you know, just to drive their margins higher. So yeah, yeah. a lot of the decisions are based on that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of blades, um, me and Randall are working on this project about the long hunters <clears throat> and then the, the beaver trappers. Hmm. So it'll be like a book, but not a book. It'll be an audio. Imagine like a mat, like a lecture, like the world's greatest lecture. The world's greatest lecture. Explaining everything about the long hunters, the deer hide hunters, like Boone, you know? Yeah. Um, and in this working, I got to seeing what their, what Boone's hatchet, you know, you'd hear like tomahawk and hatchet, tomahawk hatchet. Um, a best guess at what his hatchet would, would have looked like. Yeah. And had that dude, there's a dude. People should check him out on Instagram. Riley Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick Ford. Can you look, what, what is he on Instagram? Can someone look? Kirkpatrick Ford, Forge. I sent him the pictures. He made me one of those. A hatchet. So it's just like a, like just what Boone's hatchet probably would have looked like. Is it a single bevel or double no. bevel? No. That's why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> double bevel. Is there a definition difference between a tomahawk and a hatchet? In my mind, a yeah. tomahawk is thrown. Or is that not not that simple? No, it's just a head shape difference. My understanding, it's got that straight shaft and a different kind of head. And they used to make it with what they call it, uh, Randall, that whole teardrop. I don't know what they call it. You're talking about like the like half an anvil God, shape. I should get a different part. Par, par, partner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> should get a different partner for this project, huh? <laughs> I can't tell you, Kirkpatrick Forge. It is that. Oh, see, good mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Did you know? Put that in your little notepad there, Randall. <laughs> what is the official difference? It's like, what's the difference between a prawn and a shrimp? Depends who you ask. What is the difference? Depending on. So, so there's like, support, yeah, I, I've never found a satisfactory answer. People generally call huge shrimp prawns. Yeah. That's... And there's some regional variations. But there's also some stuff that I'm not sure about how the, the plates on its body, on its abdomen, how the plates overlap. But I don't know if that's horse shit or not. Another area of profound ignorance yeah. in my mind. Uh, but my hatchet is badass, <laughs> and I'm going to post a video. He makes these videos how he makes the stuff. It's pretty cool, man. He makes, like, it's amazing. Hmm. Um, so, uh, you know Jordan Jonas? He won uh, alone, one of the alone seasons uh -oh. um, with yeah. uh, he got a, um, he shot a moose with, a, with his bow, and then um, a wolverine was trying to get the meat, and he killed it with, a, with an axe. Mm hmm um, anyways, that's a single bevel axe. It's a traditional Siberian oh. axe. And I got to be friends with him. He sent me, sent me the axe. So I had it for a while. It's got a notch in there for every day. I think you know, 70 yeah. days he was there, but he gave you the axe. He sent it to me cause I actually did a CAD model and we were thinking about getting some made actually. Oh, I got you. Um, but anyway, it's a single bevel. So they use that to like shave bark off of the trees yeah. and things like that. But where, um, where are they yeah. filming that, <clears throat> that they can that they can buy animals without needing tags. Do they film all in Nunavak? Canada, like Vancouver Island or something? No. They, they've been in different, I think they've they been get, in different places. I think they get hunting licenses and they can just shoot like- There's you know, no way that dude, that, there's a guy that killed a muskox. He didn't draw a muskox tag, I can tell you that. <laughs> and he wasn't hunting with a guide, or he was. But it's like, I'd love to know where they're, I, I think that some of that was Nunavak. So they're like actually, they're oh, able to buy the animals from the, from the, from the um, what do they call First Nations. First Nations. They're able to buy yeah. animals from the First Nations people because you're not, you can't hunt big game in Canada without a guide. Right. I've always been I puzzled had, by that. I had a casting lady call me up about that show one time. I remember that, Chester, because yeah. Chester makes bows. Mm -hmm. Well, he quit. Yeah. Yeah. I recently got a message about uh, being on a dating show for uh, rural folks. So if we have anyone in the office here, you could put them on that. Well, and they wanted you to date. They wanted you to date. Mm hmm. Yep. Did you tell me you're married? <laughs> I did. Like farmers yep. only? You know, I don't know. It was uh, around the time. Is it because when... you're the host of the trivia show? No, I don't I don't think so. I think oh, it was come uh, on. I would imagine a hundred folks on Instagram got this same canned message about being on this dating show for like hunters, anglers, farmers, uh just rural folks is how they described it. Man. I'm it's not be getting an awkward conversation with my wife tonight, man. <laughs> you think, you think you'd do well on there? <laughs> I'm not getting any casting queries. I, I can only hope. I'd be like, we've, you know, baby, we've had a good thing going, but I had an opportunity. This could really further my career. 
<laughs> All right, Derek. I want to jump. Okay, that, 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 so that was like a that was we had like a. I want to get back to the story after the nerd session is over. <laughs> just nerd it out. I, I want to hear more. I see, I Every just, time I talk to Bill, I feel stupid. Oh, yeah, he's just sure. like a, you know, this guy's a genius. Yeah, but that's why there's have people. There's like people around, and it makes it you don't have to think about stuff. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, with me, with he's like, hey, we, he's like, hey, we're gonna make this arrow for you. I'm like, all right, great. Yeah. <laughs> I have shoot a straight. That's all I care. I got like a lot of opinions about a lot of kinds of. Uh, I have a lot of well earned opinions about rifles, ammunition, knives, apparel. But for whatever reason, I've just taken. For whatever reason, when it comes to archery, I have a. You tell me attitude. I just know who I'm going to ask. Exactly. I, I know In who the I'm going to ask. Same exact way. And, and I'm going to go because there's a thing and I'm guilty of it. Other people are guilty of it. You have a great experience, right? Like you do something and you hit a bull and the bull takes two steps and tips over or whatever, or it's a really big bull. And then the rest of your life, you're like, by God, you know, I like a right hand twist. <laughs> Did you see how big my bull was? And you're kind of like, <laughs> yeah, but you could have run eight arrow. Like, I don't know. Could you have run eight different arrow configurations through that bull and the same thing would have happened or not? Like, it's so, there's so much anecdotal, right? Or some guy's yeah. like, I'll never use that broadhead again. I lost a bull. Like, well, maybe you should have put a better shot on me. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. And so you can get drowned by the, um, unless you have just like experience after experience after experience after experience. You can get drowned um, in the anecdotal. Oh, absolutely. So I just like to have people I know. I always talk to Phelps. I like hearing what Bill has to say. Uh, it was the same way, you know, in football. Everybody's got it. You know, there's always a different way to do something, right? Uh, sp like, especially pass rushing. Because it is, ultimately, football is a violent game of chess. Uh -huh. Is what it is. It's a good because way of putting it. There's hey, no let's, call the show that. let's call the episode of that, man. Yeah, it's, it's just a violent game of chess. And it is, like, how... You fail. It's that's why it's the the relation between bow hunting and football to me is so it's so strong because hmm. you fail so much, like you fail way more than you succeed on the football field, and in those failures you have to find like the weakness that like th that you created. So I'm always like doing something to set something up later, right? So when it comes to pass rushing, I'm gonna uh, I'll bull rush a guy, right? So I'll just come off and just power him, just put my head under his chin, put my hands in his chest, and drive him back. Well, what's that going to do the next time? Next time he's going to be like, he's going to probably bull rush me again. So I'm going to sit a little heavier. Then I'd try to get by him, Got swipe it. his hands, move, you know, do something. And then, okay, that, that, that might've worked. So I try to try to swipe his hands again. So he oversets, then I spin off of that. So then, you know, that's, that's what it turns into. It turns into just like this dance. And for me, it was the same way with, um, you know, I grew up hunting whitetail and, um, in Turkey, because I grew up Ohio, Northeast okay. Ohio. Yep. So that's what I was prim primarily hunting. So Western hunting was so, like, I always wanted to do spot and stocks because you can't spot and stock whitetail in Ohio because it's, good luck. You know, you're just like, you're not going, it's not going to work. Did I, you start out young? Yeah, I killed my first whitetail when I was uh, 13, 14 years okay. old. So. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was back when you had to, no, that was back when you had to wait a while, right? It's not like now you can just, like, start your kid hunting whenever you feel like it. Well, I think, well, I started... I started like pheasant hunting when I was like nine or 10. Oh, so you were, okay, yeah. So you were like, I think it's like nine or 10 is like the cutoff. Is Cause like that, the, yeah, a lot, lot of that, a lot of that's changed so much, but I'm quite a bit older than you are. And you had to be like, you couldn't, you couldn't hunt deer with a gun until you were 14. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. See, was, I, I killed my first deer with a bow. Yeah. That was a, and uh, it was, you know, I took a climber out and was on a buddy's farm. And oh, yeah. I just like, first buck that showed its fate, you know, showed its antlers, this little, four pointer just showed up and I just started losing my mind up there and yeah. put a good shot on me, ran 14 yards and died. But, but you, know, you weren't hunting with your dad though. No, no, I don't know my dad. Um, I was hunting with yeah, friends. Uh, how, like lay that, lay, could, do you mind laying that out quick for me? How? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I grew up, um, my mom married a guy when I was, uh, three months old. Okay. I got married. Um, it wasn't my dad. Have um, you tracked your dad down now? No, tried. Can't find. Have she you gone she down doesn't like know. The... She doesn't. My mom doesn't know who it is. But well, have you gone and done like the twenty three and me? Yeah, deal? we've done all that stuff, and I'm upset now. They have now they have my DNA, and I don't like that. But, but they're know, not finding matches. They're not finding any matches. Little clusters. The, of... They found out like where I'm from, like the Scandinavian oh, yeah, Viking yeah, yeah. background and stuff. But um, it goes from Scandinavia to Ireland and then straight to Appalachia. Yeah, because so, I, I gather sometimes they'll be it'll be that oh, in some neighborhood in Cleveland. Right. Yeah. There's a bunch of 
yeah, we couldn't activity find, that seems we, like we couldn't be, find anything. Had a lot of leads that could, you know, people like, oh, he kind of looks like you, or he's big, or this, that, and it's like, <laughs> you know, it's not it, Chester. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, <laughs> <laughs> it's just we couldn't find it. So, so that's why, you know, when I got introduced, I got introduced to hunting by my stepdad. But his idea of hunting was like he'd hand me a, a 410 and sit me under a tree and yeah. tell me not to move. And I'd sit there and freeze for four hours and then we'd leave. That's not bad advice, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was, <laughs> no, he was it's right. It's better than giving you a 410 and telling you to move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was good. I mean, he'd say, yeah, sit here, don't move. And then he'd go off and, and wander off somewhere and then tell me he'll be back to get me. And I'd be sitting there just shivering. Like, it didn't matter if a deer came. I couldn't move in any ways to shoot it. So... Um, that was my idea of hunting with him. Um, so then I, when I, I met a, a friend when I was in middle school who was really into bow hunting and, uh, his brother was a little bit, a little bit taller. So when I was, when I was like 13, 12, 13, 14, I was shooting like a, probably like a 28 inch draw mm -hmm. or something like that. So I, so I could just pick up a grown man's bow and, and start shooting it. Yeah, yeah. So, so I started shooting this old PSE that he had. It was like his old bow and I was just like, it was just like a natural thing for me. I just had no problem putting the arrow where I wanted it to go. It just made sense. So I really like picked it up then and I was obsessed with it. The problem was, is that football kind of got in the way of that because September and fall, September, to October, November is football season all the way into December. So you really, you're getting like late season hunts or all that, that are available. Yep. So once I got into the, to college, I, I didn't get to hunt much at all. It was like every now and then type of thing. Right. So it was like, if I had a, you only get two weeks off a year in college football, that's all you get. So if it was like, you know, we were playing in a BCS game in January or something, we'd get like a little four day weekend where we could, I could dip off up to Northeast Ohio and hit somebody's farm. And, and I would just, you know, shoot the first thing that came. So I guess some meat and, yep. and, and that's kind of how it went. So, and I never had my, I didn't have my own bow anymore. I couldn't afford one. So I, like when I got drafted, I had $7 to my name. Didn't have a bank account. Huh. Uh, didn't have, uh, I didn't pay, I paid everything in cash because I had a Pell Grant. I just cashed that check and pay all my rent and everything out of that. <laughs> I was on scholarship, so they just paid for all the other stuff, you know? So I didn't have any I, any concept of like, you know, buying like a $1,500 Matthews. You didn't or grow up Hoy. around any kind of money. No, no. There was, everybody's pretty, the average income in my hometown is like 16000 a year. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty poor area, but a lot of hunters, everybody hunts, you know, it's like we get the first day, the first day of opening shotgun season, everybody's off from school. Like yeah. nobody goes to school that day. It's, they just call it off. So it, it's a big deal where I come from, but that's also another thing why I didn't really like gun hunting because, um, we'd go out and to public land and, sh and gun hunt. And it was like, you had to dodge bullets the whole time because if a deer jumped up and ran, it was like five or six, you know, different groups of people shooting at the same deer oh, yeah, running yeah. across the ridge. And you're standing on that ridge and you just hear the bullets whizzing by. And it's like, you know, those are big slugs, you know, so they're really only a hundred yards away from you. <laughs> so they're not far. They know that you're up there. What are you shooting up, up here for? So sure, it was yeah. just dangerous. So I just enjoyed bow hunting better because, um, you're sitting in a tree stand, you're kind of, you know, there's a strategy involved. So that's why, that's why like when I started elk hunting, when I was finally able to elk hunt, which was, you know, I waited 10 years in the NFL to f living in Denver and seeing all my buddies getting to go and this and that. And I was like, man, I, was, I would love to go. Uh, but I had no idea about the point draw and all this and that. So my first time getting to go elk hunt and really like seeing how it's the same type of chess match. It is everything can go right. But if that bull decides he doesn't want to just take another step, out of now from behind that tree, mm -hmm. it's kind of over for you. Or if the wind switches on you, like all these factors go in, go into it and everything has to happen for a reason. Like you're, you're making these moves prior, like, okay, I've spotted this bull over on this ridge. So how do I get there? I have to make all these different moves over hours of like four or five hours to get myself in position with the wind being right. So I can get, make a move on this bull. And I, there's something about that that I just, I love it. Like, yeah. I love the planning of it, and I love the, I lo even the failure, I always learn something in that failure, right? It's just the same way in the football field. If it didn't work, I learned something from it. I'm not going to go out there and try the same thing. You know, I'm going to, let's, let's switch it up and try a different route. And that's something I loved. And then what I also loved is, uh, you know, I said this on the Go Hunt podcast I was talking about. You know, when I was finally able to release an arrow on a bull, I've won, I've sacked quarterbacks in Super Bowls. Um, I've sacked Tom Brady in AFC championship games, uh, 80,000 people screaming, howling, you know, cause my last name is Wolf. So they howled. 
So <laughs> all, like that feeling is very surreal. Like when you sack somebody and jump up and howl, yeah. and then the whole oh, crowd yeah. does it with you, there's something that goes to that. But I've never felt the kind of emotions I felt when I was finally able to put my first bull down. How good's your howl? I mean, I didn't, I just was screaming. Oh. I'm just, ah, you know, <laughs> like, just like you finally released it, you know? But, but when I was finally able to put a, an arrow through, through a bull and put my hands on him, yeah. you like not, that nothing has, I'm telling, when I was, listen, when I was seven years old, I was, I was six years old. I we were, Bill and I were talking about this. I watched Reggie White and the Green Bay Packers and Brett Favre win a Super Bowl. Uh-huh. Go Pack. And I was a huge Packers fan. <laughs> and I was like, I watched Reggie White grab that Lombardi trophy and he put his Super Bowl championship t-shirt over his pads and jersey and carried that thing around. And I was like, I want to do that. That's like, that was my vision, right? That's what I want to do. That's what like sparked it right away. And I started playing tackle football next year. So my dream was to do that. Well, I got to do that. And I got to carry that Super Bowl trophy around. And it was like, I, when you reach like a goal, it's like 0.001% of people get to actually live out their childhood dream, right? It's like it's such a, a small, a small occasion, but I always dreamed of elk hunting. It seemed so far out of touch for me. Like it seemed like something I would never be able to attain growing up in Ohio. Like I, like I said, I was poor, you know, how am I going to get to Colorado? How am I going to get to Montana? Like that's thing, these things seem so far out of touch. So when I was finally able to do that, it was a stronger emotion than I had ever felt in my life. Got it. Really when I was finally able to, to connect with a bull and just like the whole, the whole experience, right? Hearing a bull come in, just screaming and just so you feel it rattling in your chest. It's an unexplainable feeling unless you've been around it and you don't even have to hunt to do it. You just go out in the, you know, take, go middle of September, go down to New Mexico and see what that's like. It's yeah. like Jurassic park out there, you know? So that was, you know, my first, my first bull was like the best feeling I've ever had in my life, you know? And I, 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 I feel bad saying that cause I have a, a daughter and, all this stuff, but like this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got this you. is a different accomplishment, right? <laughs> different like, feeling. I didn't really do anything on the, on the childbirth thing. I just was there. You know? yeah. <laughs> like I didn't have to do much, you know, but. Dude, when my, when my first kid was born, I, I passed out. Really? Yeah, because they got out that big ass <clears throat> spinal tap deal needle. Oh, for the uh, epidural? Yeah, I passed <sighs> out, man. Dude, that was. Really? You know, I later told the nurse, I said, man, I could eat your arm and it wouldn't bother me. <laughs> but you getting ready to drive that needle into my <laughs> wife's back. If you ever it. passed out before? <laughs> no, I don't run around passing no. out. No. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of I tried to spin it off and blame various things. Like I had Sounds like your to, wife's fault. I had enough she... to eat, nothing like that, yeah. you know? But yeah. I they felt had... so bad for my wife when she was getting that thing. Because she was having contractions while they were putting that in to her spine. Yeah. And I was just like, I was I was freaking out. I was so sketched out. Yeah, and the there was some thing. like, there was some little complication while they're trying to get everything hurried along, you know? Yep. Because it, well, they're well, mon- they, they're monitoring the heart, you know, whatever. I can't remember the details now, but it was it got stressful, and so they're like, "We're gonna, it can't be one way. We're gonna do it the other way." And and I woke up out in the hallway, and <laughs> head in this nurse's lap. Yeah. <laughs> like, so did how's you, everybody else doing? <laughs> did you miss the? No, the no, no I made it back in. Okay. I made it. Back in. <laughs> I mean, that was so embarrassing. I just envisioned him dragging him out. You know, so embarrassing. I envision you wrapped up like a little baby. Like <laughs> they, they, his head. they brought me into that little. They brought me that little they area where they put all little, the babies. Yeah. <laughs> like this one's already circumcised. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, when you got when you got blown up so bad about um, when you got so blown up so bad about the lion. Did it change any uh, thing about your behavior or anything? It, yeah, it did. It changed a lot. It, I felt like a sense of responsibility, right? And the responsibility side of it was that, okay, now I can see what kind of attack that we're really under as hunters. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Well, I saw, I could see it, that, that it's a really planned out attack. And uh, somebody, you know, a guy named Lou Webb, who's just an awesome guy, you know, he gave, made this analogy for me. Um, he was like, look, He's like, as hunters, we have to be like an elk herd. What do the wolves try to do to the elk herd? They try to split them apart mm-hmm. and pick out the weak and kill the weak, right? They pick them out and they start, and then that's how you kill them is you, pick, you separate the herd and then they, they follow one, kill it, and get another one, kill it. So if we want to stay together and keep this lifestyle, we have to put aside all of our, our egotistical you know, garbage, really, and it's like, Okay, who cares if you're a gun hunter or you're a rifle hunter or you're a crossbow hunter 
or you're a long bow hunter or you're a traditional bow hunter or you're a compound bow hunter. I don't care. I don't care what kind of broadhead you shoot. I don't care any of that stuff. That stuff does not matter because at the end of the day, if we don't, if we keep infighting and arguing with each other and trying to like take each other down, they're going to win because they have millions and upon hundreds of millions of dollars backing them. Mm -hmm. You know, th this industry doesn't have that kind of money. We, we, they, we have to spend that money just to keep the wildlife safe and ready to go for us to hunt them. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the amount of money that we spend on gear and stuff like they are, are spending all that money just on ending it. Yep. Ending it, they don't want us to do it. Like something about it, they hate. They don't care. That you can't reason with them. And I felt a sense of responsibility to try to bring us together as hunters and try to keep us in that tight little group and like stick together. You know, so I did. I felt a big sense of responsibility, but I also, um, I also had this sense of like, you know, I don't want to get too vulgar, but fuck them. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like I did everything by the book. I'm not poaching. The amount of money that our ta our money our, all the money that we spend on hunting goes straight into the keeping their trails going. It, they don't. Uh, how do they not realize this? Yeah. That you want to you want you want your lakes and you want your trails and you want your bike paths and you want all this stuff taken care of. Who do you think pays for that? Hunters pay for that. So as a conservationist, and uh, hunters are conservationists. You know, if you do it by the book, that's what you're doing, right? You're out. I'm not out just looking for any lion to kill, right? I'm not out just looking for any elk to kill or any bear, any deer. I'm looking for a big mature animal that is, and I'm going to eat that animal. And it's everything is used. I use everything. Yeah, and you're you're in your opera in in your case, as we highlighted, you're operating within. A very, a very finely tuned state and federal sanctioned yeah activity yeah the North American model is the gold standard yeah and it's and it's and it's like this is how this elaborate team of biologists and land managers have decided to maintain and and utilize a resource. I point out you know, like the wolf analogy is good. There's another one people say, you know, we're all in this boat together. And I'll point out that now and then certain people will shoot. We're in the boat together and they'll shoot holes in the bottom of the boat. Mm -hmm. Meaning people, you know, you know, I'm talking about people who go and and not only operate outside of any kind of legal framework, but operate outside of any, you know, they, they become unproductive. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're not helpful. Right. Yeah. People who are, you know, violating like like repeat violation of laws, willful violation of laws, give people a black eye. But I think that like you're saying, man, um for for someone to be operating in accordance with the law, when we generally all agree on how these things are established, to then have that person be crucified, I think is also an attack on this very effective wildlife management system. Oh yeah. And it, they'll put false statements out there. You know, there's a, an organization, we won't say their name, but everybody can probably imagine who they were. Starts with a P. Um, they put out that I, that I, um, I, I, I poached, a, they've said that I poached it or did it illegally or yeah, yeah, yeah. that these animals are, are, um, like mountain lions are the only big cat thriving in North America. Like they are thriving. Go to California. The deer population is like decimated. Yeah, they're expanding. They're expanding numbers. Yeah, they're colonizing new territory yeah. and expanding numbers because that's what they do, you know. And then they're like, "Well, why can't you just, uh, you know, move it to another area?" Well, where are we going to move it to? Because there's already well, a lion in that area. You know what? If you'd have done that, you know what you'd been doing. You've been breaking the law. Breaking the law. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You're not, you can't, you just so can't do that. So why is there a lion in the back of your truck? I decided to take it upon myself <laughs> to move it to a new area. I darted it. Yeah. Darted it. <laughs> be like Ricky Bobby. <laughs> Were you surprised by any of your allies in the football community or otherwise when this went down? I was surprised by the lack of the allies. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah. By, uh, you know, I dealt with this in multiple things, right? So I, I refused to get vaccinated and- I, uh, a Did you lot get in trouble of, for that? I got fined a lot of money. But, really? Uh, yeah, but I just, huh. I, the science, well, they kept saying believe in the science. I'm like, well, the science isn't there, so I'm not going to believe anything that you tell me. Um, I also wouldn't kneel during the anthem, so I lost a lot of friends over that. But I'm- Hold on a minute. You lost friends for not kneeling? Yeah, they, I was, so the, uh, there was a, a the Wash, I think it was the Washington Post- uh, front page put Derek Wolf tells, they asked me, why aren't you going to kneel? 
And I was like, well, because, you know, I have a lot of friends and family and people that have served. And I if, remember, I if, remember this. if even one person says that it offends them or like kind of makes them feel weird about it and they don't like it, I'm not going to do it. If it, even one veteran says that, yeah. I'm still not, I'm not going to kneel. Um, I didn't, when I, went, I didn't know they, there was a pressure. I didn't know there was a pressure. Oh, I knew there was a norm. There was big pressure. Time pressure. There big was time a pressure, pressure to, to kneel. Yeah, big time pressure. We were very pressured. They pressured us heavy to just kind of jump on board and do it. You uh, didn't get fined for that. No, I didn't get fined for that, but I did get labeled as a racist. So the Washington Post put on, Derek Wolf tells his black teammates to go back to Africa. What? When all I said was, if you don't love... If you don't love this country, I had just traveled to Thailand, so I saw what these people lived like on the Bangkok River. I saw what, you know, these little mountain towns in Chiang Mai, how they lived, and they're happy as could be, but I realized how privileged we are to live in, in America. Like, even the poorest of the poor are living better than yeah. how they're living over there, um, and they're still happy. But to me, I said, if you, don't love, if you don't love this country, we live in the best country in the world. If you don't love this country, then why do you live here? Yeah. That's no. all I said. It's just a simple question. Like, why do you stay? Like, you, yeah. you're well, you're free to go and come and go as you please, you know. So um, that was they interpreted that as, and they put it in quotes too. So I had to really, the, yeah. And when I finally got him to take it down, the damage was already done. So now I got teammates of mine who I'd won a Super Bowl with looking at me like, dude, I thought like, are you like, is he a racist? They're like, my family's calling me, asking me if you're a racist, if you're this, if you're that. I'm like, dude, what? The, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, really? So yeah, I dealt with stuff like that before. So and then when this when the lion thing came out, I noticed it even more. You know that people were like distancing themselves from me, and I was like, whatever, man. Like mm -hmm. I'm gonna be who I am. I'm gonna stick to my beliefs. I'm not gonna change for for anybody, especially when I'm not hurting anybody. Uh, just because somebody's offended, yeah, you know, yeah. by the lifestyle that I live, because I I love this lifestyle, and it's it, it brings me, you know, killing an animal. It's not the point. It's the journey. Like my favorite part of that hunt and, and that story is the journey to get there. And you notice how when I tell the story, it's a small, very small part of actually when I shot the animal. Yeah. Most of the story is the grind to get there. It's the same with every animal. So they take they all, but all they want to see is the because because that's what happens is you post a picture, right? It's like look, you know, check it out, you know. But the only reason I'm doing, I'm not going to post a picture of something I just walked up and and was able to kill easy. I want to tell the story about how difficult it was. And how much of a grind it was to get to that point. So, so to me, if you if if you don't want to be friends with me because of that, then I don't really want to be friends with you anyway. So that's fine. Yeah. You know, but even even you know, people will still come up and be like, "Did you really have to kill that lion?" It's like, who cares? Who? What do you care? Why do you care? Mm -hmm. I did everything by the book. It wasn't like some somebody's pet. Plus, you know, be, like, be like, are you? A is that an actual question? <laughs> yeah. Like I. Like, yeah. <laughs> Really? Like, why do you care? You know, I, but you try to educate it, educate them on it. Uh, you know, I did an interview on Tucker Carlson where I just started hitting him with numbers because I knew I was going to have a short segment. So I was like, I'm going to take the opportunity to hit him with some conservation numbers uh -huh. about how many attacks on people happen. Like once, one a year, one, every two years, somebody gets killed by a lion. Yeah. Um, and then what they do to the cubs and what that does to the population of the lions. So it's actually good for the population of lions to take out these big mature toms. If your goal was to have more lions. Right. Yeah. If it, if we were out there just wanting to kill lions, we'd go out there and just start shooting every lion you saw. But you still, you do, you would like to have a healthy lion population because it's still cool to have, have those things around. Um, but when it comes to like the wolves, that's what, this actually segued me into this, the whole wolf or, uh, you know, trying to keep the wolves out of different areas. Colorado's already kind of screwed on that one, but the least we can do is make it available to hunt them, which yeah. is still, you're never going to dent that population because it's impossible. I mean, look at the coyotes. You know, coyotes yeah, just destroy You, can, you can definitely, yeah. It's a good man. I think it's a good management tool to have like a sort of controlled growth. Yeah. Of, of you know, I mean, we've been doing it here. Like we've been doing it well here, Idaho, Wyoming. I mean, we've been hunting out, we've been hunting wolves now for years and still seeing expansions of population, healthy numbers. It's not like it's the, the way it's positioned as an either or is ridiculous. It's, 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 so, it's like either you either can have wolves or you can have wolf hunting, which will result in no wolves. And, and that argument has been thoroughly, I mean, no one would know it. No one from PETA would realize it. No. But that argument has been thoroughly put to rest that you can, you can very successfully. Um, you can very successfully have healthy, stable wolf populations 
alongside state managed wolf hunting. Yeah. And it's been, there, there is zero cases with mountain lion hunting. There are zero cases where modern, like regulated hunting of mountain lions. I'm not talking about back in 1890 when they were poisoning them with strychnine. Yeah. Regulated hunting of mountain lions having any appreciable impact on mountain lion numbers. It's like, it, it's just not a thing. Yeah, it's not. You're going to have roughly the same amount of lions. You're going to have the same amount of lions, whether, you know, if you're hunting them or not hunting, especially when you factor in that the lion like you got would have statistically, however, it would have wound up being killed by a state agent. Yeah, because it, like it was too comfortable around people. California, as soon as they got rid of lion hunting, the number of lions they kill, that, that state biologists kill, goes through the roof. And now they're killing the same number of lions annually as they always were. When they could be, that, that they're missing out on opportunity for people to hunt them. People used to pay to go do it. Yeah, now you people, pay a guy to go do it. Yeah. Do you think the lion, you think when the lion gets killed, he's like, well, thank God it was a government agent. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> yes, it's like, of course not. It's silly. Honestly, it's silly. And it's, and, and you like, know what I think it is? I was just hoping, I was just hoping it wasn't some local. <laughs> yeah. I hope it wasn't some guy out here. Better not have been just some guy, some hunter. I'm glad he's know? got, glad he's got lights on his And truck. I think this is all has to badge. do with the, mo it's, it's because they're not thinking, they don't want to hear the science or the rationality behind it. They're just thinking emotionally, which I understand that they're emotional about it and they love cats or whatever. Like, but you know, at the end of the day, man, like, you have to manage if you're going to live in within the nature, like if you're going to build houses up in the mountains and you're going to live in the mountains, you have to manage that, that population. It's here's the other thing that frustrates me about this conversation is that at this point they're managed as a big game animal. The regulations are more strict. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, if you like, if anyone ever, if anyone who's like uneasy about mountain lion hunting from not in terms of that, they feel bad for the mountain lion. If anyone's uneasy about mountain lion hunting in terms of that, it's like exercise in a reckless fashion. I would invite you to go and try. If you're not from a hunting background, I would invite you to go and try to understand mountain lion regulations. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of how thinly sliced the map is and all the quota systems around males, mm -hmm. females, tiered season structures. You have to take a test Dude, before you get your license. It's like, you know, you could most places you get yourself a deer license. It's like the most you got to figure out is that, you know, you get like whatever amount of time and it's either got antlers or it don't, yeah. you know, you get into, um, these 24 hour, 48 hour reporting hotlines mm. so that you have like a, a portion of a mountain range carved off and you're going to allow one female. And if that female gets killed, you have X hours to register it. The whole season shuts down within 48 hours. There's, no, there's like nothing like that. No. I mean, some bighorn sheep stuff. There's really that level of detailed management. I shouldn't say nothing because there's a handful of fur bears that fall into that. But anyways, that's like, that, that's a level of focus and precision that is not exercised elsewhere. No. Not broadly exercised I, elsewhere. I could explain Montana's hunting regs to just about anybody with the exception of <laughs> mountain lions. I, I wouldn't know where to begin to start. Yeah. Like yeah. it's just inordinately complicated. Yeah. And it's they they it's it's managed at it's managed as like a long-term renewable resource. Yeah. And very focused. And like that has not like I want to be clear that has not always been the case. But that's the case now. Right. You know. Well, it's funny cuz you always, you know, you talk about, you know, what they used to do back in the day. When you see those old-timey pictures of guys you know, at hunt camp and it's like five guys and they got like 10 deer hanging in the background. Sure. You know, a bunch of 10 deer, a bear, a lion. Yep. They got all these different animals because there was, the rules weren't there. They could just go out and do whatever they wanted. I'm going to post a picture from a guy gave me a picture from 1954 of uh, a bunch <laughs> of dudes in Utah. I don't know what the regs, there was regs in 1954, but um, with a flatbed, Loaded with mule deer like you would not, <laughs> like bucks like you would not believe. Just giants. You can't even tell how many are in there. But <laughs> Good old some days. Of the, just like some of the bucks in that truck are like, what? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, definitely it's, like, there, there's like spreads in there. There's like a buck in there that's got to have, I don't know, 36 inch. But they're just piled in there. Yeah, piled. It's insane. <laughs> it blows my mind. You know, even these like old time duck hunters and stuff too. You see these piles of duck, like no limits, you know. I've got an old photo from my grandpa that I need to get in 
like maybe the podcast room, well, it's pretty full, or my office, but it's big blown up photo of like what you guys are talking about. A bunch of deer. There's a couple frozen foxes. Yeah. Hanging out the back. It's pretty cool. It's photo. pretty wild. LA LA Huffman was this great photographer that he uh photography is just becoming a, a thing that you could, you know, move around with a camera. And this dude named LA Huffman made it out to Miles City, Montana in the winter of eighteen eighty one. So he got to do photos of the so the last big buffalo slaughter was the winter of eighty one, eighty two. It was when the railroad hit Miles City and kind of tapped into the core of the northern herd. And they killed a couple million that winter. And that was the last big shoot. Um, and he got to go, he took photos of some of these hide hunters. And there's this one photo he has. They, they used to make these dugouts. They just dig into a cut bank. And um, the amount of like stuff <laughs> that they got piled up around there, right down to frozen buffalo fetuses as decorations and then some of those pictures he took too of like the mule deer heads and even that the white tail heads where it'd be like just one dude standing there with like a with a dugout canoe and 50 bucks <laughs> <laughs> wow just, i mean you look at it you gotta be like that would have been a pretty good time check that out but on the other hand you're like oh my god man well that just shows and you these how guys many there probably were yeah, these guys are shooting for the mining. They're they're shooting for the mining camps. Yeah, mm-hmm. shooting meat for the mining camps, and um, and like even just what what was their awareness about? Were they were they you know Colonel Dodge of Dodge City, Colonel Dodge talked about what he thought was just this extraordinary mule deer that was lost in a fire, and he'd be like, I would love to see what that guy thought what what that guy <laughs> in 1870 thought was just an extraordinary mule deer. It's probably just ridiculous. Oh, you'd man. love just, to know, right? Yeah, you'd love to. Because you look at these pictures. These pictures, these guys are like, nah. You're like, dude, you like. It's a 200 inch buck. Yeah, those bucks ain't around. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you got like six of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been great. It would have been great to see some of that you stuff. Know, you know, man. it's funny. You talk, I heard you say something. I forget I forget what episode you were talking about. We talked about like a time machine. Like, where would you want to go? Mm-hmm. And I, I think you talked about uh, Daniel Boone coming through the, the Cumberland Gap. Yeah. And uh, that, like, when you said that, that just stuck with me because I was like, man, I always thought that way too. Like, I'd be walking, you know, walking in Appalachia and coming through these mountains and, you know, what was it like out here before all these people came in here? Like, what was the wildlife like? Because I know how the, I mean, there's deer everywhere. Well, you'll have to listen to, I was going to say this. You know, we got a project just for you. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Perfect. Because we're going to, we're going to tackle that question. In I just our, think that would be incredible. No, we're gonna we're gonna get into a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, what what were those guys? How did they hunt? What were they doing? What were they seeing? What was it like? Why was that area so full of game? Yeah, probably not what you'd expect. Yeah, um, you know, you know, it's 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 a crazy story. Uh, you gonna stick around for trivia? Yeah, Bill, you gonna play trivia? Did you play sure. trivia before? I did. Yeah. Did you lose? I did not win. Did you beat the Shelby Index? Um, we'll talk about it on the show. <laughs> oh, how about that? Oh, hey, I got a thing for you. What's up? A stat. A guy proposed a stat. Okay. Can I tell you that now? Yeah. He thinks that you ought to do, when I was doing the, the oh, you know, it keeps, here's the thing. Funny is uh, I already told Corinne this story. Two, I got two things for you real okay. quick. Someone came up to me and said, um, they couldn't figure out why Corinne did so bad at trivia. <laughs> And I told Corinne that they said that they looked her up and she looks very smart. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. Just they couldn't make any sense out of it. Yeah. They can't even make any sense out of it. I don't know what they're expecting to see when they looked her up. They're expecting to see someone that just looked like a poor performer at trivia. I don't know. <laughs> Here's the stat, and uh-huh. it's a good one. Okay. Strong, strong, strong closers and strong beginners. Mm. Like, you know how people say, you know, that the, right, they start strong, they come back and finish strong. Uh-huh. Is there anything to that? Well, we've seen with the overtime questions that Brody is by far our weakest performer. On the contrary, I think you're our strongest performer in overtime, Steve. Mm-hmm. Does that make you feel good? It makes you feel great. Yeah. So I, I don't know because the, the 10 questions are kind of random about how they're organized, but I think you can pick up a lot of, uh, a lot of intel about how folks handle overtime. Uh, oh, one thing I was wanted to add, we work with a guy, Garrett Long. He's going to hook you up with a bunch of first light stuff. Okay, cool. Sweet. Yeah. So he's going to get you squared away on that. Um, 
And then you're going to stick around for trivia. Bill's going to play trivia. You didn't win last time. Did not. Do you feel like you're going to win? No. Really? No. Not oh, a chance. Oh, here's a quick question you for gotta you. Gotta believe athlete. You know, you, know, athlete. Is, you know how you throw a bone to guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there gonna be like a double bone throw? We have one for each of them. What's oh, the nice. what kind of nice. categories are there? We will talk about it. We'll talk about it on the show. <laughs> Play the drop, Phil. <laughs> <laughs>